Hi everyone, Chuthany Food Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for a classic review of this Swans album, Soundtracks for the Blind. Classic review of the 1996 album from New York experimental rock band Swans. A legendary and storied album that is one of the most beloved in all of underground music, which if you haven't heard it, you might be wondering, why? Well, to know the significance of Soundtracks for the Blind, uh, you have to understand where it lands in the context of Swan's discography, and more broadly, the world of weirdo left-field rock music. As Swan, save for their breakup immediately after this album, have been active in some way, shape, or form since 1982. So their artistic trajectory is difficult to sum up efficiently, especially since you could break the band's career up into multiple eras. First, you have the earliest years that see the band dabbling in heavy, crushing no wave and noise rock music, not as dynamic or as nuanced as the stuff they would eventually go on to release, but arguably the most thrilling, hard hitting, and explosive uh, moment in the band's career. Then, toward the end of the 80s, the band's sound and songwriting really began to mature past the uh, noisy and chaotic brutality of cop and filth. You hear that heaviness and rawness of their early stuff begin to exist in support of music that took on more of an ominous goth rock tone uh, with elements of folk and country too. Some industrial slipped in as well for good measure, especially on records like Children of God, uh, which are excellent. Following this, there was kind of an attempt at a commercial run with the album The Burning World, which uh, uh, was not successful, and maybe that is for the best, because it did push the band to drill further into a bigger, deeper, more grandiose sound, resulting in a pretty prolific handful of years. I'm talking about White Light from the Mouth of Infinity, as well as its sister a record Love of Life. Also, the following Great Annihilator, which I think is uh, one of the best Swans albums ever. And doing this uh, review has uh, reminded me of how amazing these albums truly are, how heavy, droning, and powerful a lot of their instrumentation and production is, and how transcendental they sound in their best moments, too. I would actually argue these records contribute uh, some of the best music to the neo-folk, industrial rock, and goth rock canons, respectively. And in some respects, these 90s Swans albums are even better than soundtracks for the blind in terms of having more cohesive sounds, punchier songwriting, as well as better track list flows. But soundtracks for the blind, I think, lacks a lot of that stuff because it is absolutely positively not concerned with it. What it is concerned with is hard to call as this thing is a two hour and 22 minute beast of an album that sees Swans at their most out there, difficult to process, and chaotic, which was certainly a reflection of the band at the time, because remember, I'm glossing over a lot of history and roster changes uh, to go over their catalog as efficiently as I am. There have been at least a couple key times over the course of the band's existence where the lineup has pretty much been dissolved and then reset. And sure, while Michael Girard has always been uh, considered the mastermind of the group, the band's history also reveals this ever-changing roster of musicians uh, that over the years have contributed greatly to uh, whatever sound the band is embodying at the time, while often having other creative obligations going on in their lives, whether that be solo work or additional bands. Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth fame was actually a part of one of the earliest iterations of Swans, not to mention the various people who have made names for themselves by being a part of the band's musical DNA. Percussionist Thor Harris or guitarist Norman Westberg, for example, and of course, composer and vocalist Jarbo. Now, this loose and sprawling hierarchy of contributors and creative projects uh, wasn't limited to Swan's lesser members. Michael Gira himself was guilty of it too. Uh, this was rumored to be part of the reason as to why the band broke up initially. Creative efforts being spread too thin, lack of money and success in the band's overall trajectory, creative differences, or maybe the band's sound and style had grown so far past its initial inception point, maybe it no longer made sense to operate under the Swan's name. One thing is for sure, Jira would continue to stay active and creative uh, post the dissolution of Swans, often in projects that featured musicians he already had a history with from Swans, the most significant of which has to be Angels of Light, which saw Michael and this new band circling back to a lot of the heavy, linear, goth country dirges from the White Light era, but now on a grander and more 
improved scale. And sure, while it is technically a different band, it's hard not to see the music on this record as an extension of everything Swans was developing in the 90s. Even some of the more experimental stuff on what was once their final record, Soundtracks for the Blind. Because, yes, for a time, this was the band's last studio album. And now, I think a lot of people watching this channel are well aware of the fact that uh, over 10 years later, uh, Swans would come back, reformed, drop new music. I've reviewed all of that comeback stuff, which has led to me being viewed as, like, you know, kind of a big Swans fan. I've loved most of these albums, and I did give one of them a 10. One of them got a 10, which led to a lot of discourse the rest is recent history. But going even further back into history to get to the uh, uh, topic of this video, Soundtracks for the Blind, which prior to the comeback was the band's swan song. And what a weird swan song it was. Looking back upon it, honestly, I'm not surprised that this record spelled uh, the band's demise because it doesn't even seem to be all that sure of what it is. Is it dark ambient drones? Is it random jam snippets? Is it frightening sound? collages? Is it field recordings and private voice recordings? Is it massive experimental rock crescendos? Grand builds of vocals, guitar, bass, drums, and keys that reach out into the stratosphere? The song Volcano feels like it pretty much invents Grimes' whole career in 5 minutes and 19 seconds. And don't listen to Hypo Girl before you go to sleep because you will have a nightmare. The critical acclaim of this album is interesting because if you take Swan's entire catalog up until this point into account, it's uncharacteristically inconsistent. And maybe even the title itself is an admission of its lack of vision. However, this album does truly live up to the experimental descriptor because uh, you really have no idea what the fuck it's going to do next. And it kind of runs like a compilation uh, from maybe six or seven different artists as opposed to a a complete album, which actually makes sense because not all the recordings on this record were recent at the time. Some span all the way back to the early 80s, especially during some of the more abstract and collage moments on the project, which from what I understand were assembled from a pretty wide array of sources, sessions, demos, performances, then altered and reassembled to work together as a new piece that is both current and retrospective all at once, which was not only impressive because we're talking about Michael uh, working through the limitations of uh, 90s recording technology at the time, but also he's effectively attributing his own artistic trajectory here in quite a creative way that we see re-employed uh, to an extent uh, during that long collage piece on The Beggar, uh, the most recent Swans album at the time of this recording. So, with the band being on death's doorstep, things were clearly in a state of creative disarray, but that state of being led to a lot of super creative and groundbreaking out there shots in the dark that would inspire a variety of different experimental and underground music trends for the next decade. Countless noise, post-rock, and goth rock albums from the 2000s owe some level of debt to Swans, which is part of the reason this album is so highly praised. Then, for some time post-Disillusion, I'm sure it was easy to become kind of infatuated with this LP's uh, lost potential, considering this is where the band died. Unless you were listening to Michael G. Ra's solo or side band stuff, uh, for more than 10 years you had no other choice other than to sit there and wonder what could have been. But a lot of musical history has been made since the release of this record, both by Swans and the bands they inspired, and because of that I think this album is due for at least a little bit of a creative reassessment. I'm not so sure it's held up perfectly with the band's most recent chapter coming to a close. Cause again, I think Swans' previous records are a lot more focused by comparison, and I think the kinks and finer details of what the band was attempting during the longer and more expansive pieces on this record were pretty much worked out post comeback. As Swans has recently released some of the biggest and most powerful releases of their career to be kind, uh, The Glowing Man, but still I suppose everything has to start somewhere. And it's for that reason that when I go back to soundtracks these days uh, that I often find myself enjoying it more in concept than in practice. As there are multiple moments that serve as reminders of stuff maybe the band was doing better previously, built upon later when they came back, or maybe developed a little bit further along 
on a side project that had uh, more room for it to breathe. Among the 26 tracks on this album, there's a lot of detours, a lot of loose ends, what I see as bloat to some degree as well, but that doesn't mean the album is without its highlights or its merits. It's withstood the test of time and is often cited as uh, the band's best album for a reason, and while it does fail to build up much momentum on the macro level, there are loads of strange, amazing, mind-blowing, and uh, totally whacked out individual moments uh, fragmented across the album's two discs. You have short-lived beds of instrumentation that are dramatic, cinematic, and also sit somewhere between eerie and breathtaking, whether that be Red Velvet Corridor or Mellow Thumb, uh, Surrogate 2, or Live Through Me. Meanwhile, the meteor cuts on this thing see the band digging into the darkest and heaviest depths of their sound yet, like with the crushing riffs and strange, watery verses all over all lined up, or the buzzing walls of guitar and haunting, washed-out tones on the beautiful days. You also have low-key, scary field recordings dealing in a mortality and the fragility of the aging human body on how they suffer, which is also explored to some extent on Minus Something, where you have this disembodied voice from somebody uh, who is talking about uh, missing something, some kind of zest, some kind of life in their body, in their mind. Uh, the vocals are pitched down in a way that just feels uh, very unsettling. Meanwhile, the reverb drenched tones that are howling away in the background uh, just come across as otherworldly. Some of these more mid-sized cuts get especially good on disc two, especially during this three-track run of Empathy, which is this uh, slow, brooding cut that feels like a precursor to Angels of Light. Then I Love You This Much, which feels like I'm trapped on a merry-go-round from hell, and then also YRP. But it is the lengthiest moments on the album where many say uh, this record reaches its true power. These slow-moving, moody, and dramatic, explorative rock pieces that are sometimes topped with a very depraved poetry from Jira that eventually build up to these transcendental instrumental peaks. Helpless Child is obviously a key example of that, which for sure is incredible and groundbreaking for its time and today, but most definitely leapfrogged by Swans itself on recent releases, which I would also say is the case for Animus to some degree, whose most heavy and chaotic moments dip in and out of sounding as uh, tight and as fluid and as powerful as I think they're intending to. However, the sound, I think, is a moment that can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything Swans has put out as of late. It features such an incredible build across its 13-minute runtime, and just when you think it's gotten at peak volume, it just seems to get heavier and louder and just more crushing. Meanwhile, the final sacrifice is the most spacious and trippy of all of these tracks, with lots of echo and reverb play across its runtime. Michael uh, delivers an absolutely blood-curdling and freakish vocal performance. The track slowly drones on and on and on and creates this uh, kind of transcendental and spiritual experience across its performance. Something that, in essence, I think Swans has gotten better at capturing in the studio over the years. I think it's also better embodied on the Swans Are Dead Live album. Uh, they dropped shortly after the release of this record, too. But that's my overall assessment of this very bold, unique, adventurous, and creative album, which miraculously is still talked about uh, by experimental music fans across the board to this day. And while, in my view, the band has very much outdone themselves uh, in regards to this record since their comeback, it still remains that everything the band has achieved since uh, comes back to this. And even with this record being as old and as widely copied as it is, the impact and experience of listening to it is still wild. Its core ideas still very much sound and out there, even if the execution isn't perfect and its overall vision not the clearest. Finally, I'll say I'm grateful to live in a time where I actually got to see a lot of the ideas on this album and the band itself kind of come full circle. Those are my thoughts on this LP. What are yours? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Transition, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like, please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Swans, uh, forever.